We're just going to go come around a little bit further down the corner, around the, from the front, uh, just in the pre-temporal area. Mike talked a little bit about infratemporal fossa extensions, why you'd use the orbital cranial to look down into the infratemporal fossa. I'm just going to just talk about the infratemporal fossa tumors and the use of what I guess has been termed in the past, the subtemporal infratemporal fossa approach. And like any of these approaches, there are many variations of that approach that can be used. The, uh, Pathologies that occur in the infratemporal fossa are a myriad. You know, the benign ones, the most common are um, uh, meningiomas that extend transcranially, schwannomas, both of the trigeminal, and I've seen some vidian schwannomas in that location, juvenile nasopharyngeal angiofibromas, or other benign tumors. Um, malignant ones, are, we see a lot of uh, the primary uh, infratemporal fossa malignancies, uh, osteosarcoma, Ewing's, rhabdo, synovial cell sarcoma, or chondrosarcoma. And then we see a lot of extensions of uh, uh, anterior uh, maxillary and facial uh, carcinomas, squamous cell carcinoma, adenoid cystics, which travel typically through the uh, trigeminal nervous system back towards the infratemporal fossa, and rarely other diseases. Uh, in the last, I looked in the last five years, uh, and this is what, how it broke down at our place, uh, you know, 10 uh, benign tumors and uh, that number of malignancies. So the majority of the, of the work here is based on malignant disease. The infratemporal fossa, uh, you know, has definable boundaries. Uh, the anterior boundaries, the posterior wall, the maxillary, uh, the maxilla, the medial boundaries, the pharyngeal wall. Laterally, it's the ascending ramus of the mandible and the zygomatic arch. Posteriorly, the styloid diaphragm, which separates the infratemporal fossa from the um, um, carotid space. And superiorly, it's the floor of the middle cranial fossa, and inferiorly, it's a line drawn through the inferior border of the angle of the mandible. Uh, these are uh, anatomic drawings uh, that we did, and I, I think what's really important to notice here are the lines, uh, the planes, uh, the, the cleavage lines between the different structures. And uh, specifically, uh, this is an important one. It's a, it's, it's a, a plane that's a, a medial to the pterygoid musculature, medial to the uh, uh, mandibular nerve, but lateral to the pharyngeal wall. And I think if you're doing a tumor, uh, excisions of uh, the entire infratemporal fossa, this is going to be your me uh, medial boundary. Uh, and you find that just medial to your um, pterygoids and to your max, um, mandibular division of the trigeminal nerve. So a real simple case. This is just a young man with a, a lesion. Well, he had some pain. It'll describe a lesion at the base of his pterygoid plate. And you can see the loss of uh, marrow signal at the base of the pterygoid plate here. Here you see on, on the uh, CAT scan, it has a fairly smooth uh, border, so we m believed up front that it was a, a benign uh, process. The, uh, the approach, uh, what, this drawing shows the entire full-blown subtemporal and pretemporal fossa incision. But with this uh, gentleman, only, as Mike showed, we just need to uh, look uh, down below the zygomatic arch. So we did a, a, a zygomatic arch osteotomy. That allowed us to bring the, the uh, temporalis muscle inferiorly and uh, allow us this view. So we haven't done a craniotomy. Uh, the temporalis muscle is under this retractor. Uh, this is the back wall, the maxilla. And this is the ter uh, pterygoid plates right here. And uh, this is the pterygoid maxillary fissure. So uh, being entirely extracranial, you can get to this point, uh, open that up, and uh, remove that, uh, which and this is the exact direction of our approach. Uh, this was an eosinophilic granuloma um, pathology. As we get more complex, uh, tumors, it doesn't really change what we need to see. Uh, the exposure really is, is the same. You can see where this meningioma is sitting. Um, the zygomatic arch uh, just needs to come down a little bit, so we get the uh, temporalis muscle out of the way, and we have the direct lateral approach to this tumor. This is a uh, trigeminal schwannoma from the uh, mandibular division. Just moving the zygomatic arch gets you into the tumor. Once you're in the tumor, you don't need anything else. Um, you, you, you know, you, you don't have to turn a craniotomy here. You just need to remove a little bit of bone here, maybe a centimeter and a half, and then you have the entire tumor in your surgical field. This tumor, you see, is a little different, a little more anterior. This is a V2 schwannoma extending both uh, intracranial and into the infratemporal fossa. You want to be a little bit more forward, so I think in this uh, situation we did add a, uh, a orbitozygomatic osteotomy. Again, we did not... Uh, do a formal craniotomy. We did a subtemporal craniectomy. 
So the, uh, that goes in one piece, reflected in fairly on the masseter. Uh, here is the intraoperative view. This is the orbit here. This is a, just a little bit of dura exposed here. This is the tumor in the infratemporal fossa, temporalis muscle, is rotated inferiorly along with the uh, orbitozygomatic osteotomy. Once, we, once the tumor is out, here's the orbit. Here's a little bit of the bone removal. That's all we really see of the temporal dura. And this is the uh, sphenoid sinus. So coming through the, uh, the anterior, uh, medial and anterolateral triangles, we get into the sphenoid sinus, temporalis muscles inferior. We just reconstruct, and, and you know, you can take that up higher too. So if the tumor goes up into the uh, cavernous sinus, these, especially these trigeminal schwannomas, um, you can ex just add this exposure through the same thing. Look, just a little small craniotomy here to get uh, subtemporal. But this gets you your uh, V1 carotid, V2, V3 carotid, GSPN, the apex is out here too. Sinus is open here, there's Vidian. So I, I think uh, just that without having to turn a formal frontal cranial, uh, craniotomy, Move the zygomatic, orbozygomatic arch out of the way, do a subtemporal craniectomy, remove your greater wing sometimes, and you can uh, have an ample uh, view. And, re and here's the reconstruction again a, a plate on the orbit, a plate on the body, important, and a plate at the back of the arch. Now we're starting to some malignancies. It's a little bit different, you know, because I think, uh, you know, we want to ideally stay extra tumoral uh, if possible. Uh, and uh, in order to achieve a margins negative type of resection. This is one of the lower um, grade of malignancy. But I think uh, with the higher grade malignancies, you know, you, you, uh, you want to take out all the uh, structures touching cancer, including the back wall, the maxilla, the mandible, the uh, infratemporal fossa. So this is what we're going to try to do here. And, and again, remembering the, your, we talked about those planes this is a divided mandibular nerve, which again, this was a, a can, uh, malignancy, a sarc primary uh, sarcoma, which spared the maxillary division of the uh, trigeminal nerve, but was right here with the mandibular division going into it. But when you divide the mandibular division, just medial to it, you get into that plane we saw, just medial to the pterygoids, and that just takes the entire infratemporal fossa off of the, of the pharynx. So this is a pharyngeal wall here. In the sphenoid sinus, you open it here, vidian is there, and here you can get, when you look anteriorly, you can actually go into the maxillary sinus this way, and if you work anteriorly, you're into the nasal pharynx, you can actually see the opposite eustachian tube right there. That is, that, you're able to do that because of the planes in the infratemporal fossa that are medial to the pterygoid musculature. And that's that plane there. That really facilitates the on block removal of that, of that area. And that's what you can kind of get. Now, the, the, there's really not much important in the infratemporal fossa functionally. You know, you have the V2 and V3, but, but not much else. But the, it's what's really next to the infratemporal fossa that's real important. You know, so you've got your, your parapharyngeal space there, your carotid space. This is a multiply recurrent embryonal rhabdo in a heavily treated young lady. Uh, no idea whether we're going to find a plane on that carotid artery or not. So I think you have to plan for that ahead of time, and uh, for this uh, young lady, we did the, here's her old incision, we did the full core press, we brought that incision down into her neck, uh, did a formal neck dissection, uh, got the vessels um, uh, up front, so that we could have this view. Here are the great vessels. We uh, did not take out her parotid, uh, we worked under her mandible, kept the, uh, dissected out the facial nerve, here's the upper branch of the facial nerve at the top of that um, soft tissue here, and then took down her previous work and left us with this. Working from above, down, from submandibularly up, we're able to take that out on block. The carotid artery is here, 12. This is the maxillary division, a trigeminal. Mandibular is gone, and the infratemporal fossa is empty. Orbit is here. And this is a free flap, replacing the infratemporal fossa. Um, and these are type of examples where that kind of operation is necessary, osteosarcomas, Ewing's, this is an adenocarcinoma, believe it or not, a hemangioperiocytoma right here, recurrent synovial cell sarcoma and a rhabdomyosarcoma. So uh, people always ask about malignancies in the infratemporal fossa. They um, traditionally have done poorly. Um, I think uh, that data tends to uh, exist in the pre-aggressive uh, skull-based multimodal therapy. This is a modern series of uh, 39 patients had infratemporal fossa extension. All had multimodal management. 
And uh, the uh, median progression-free survival in all comers was two and a half years, median overall survival 4.7 uh, years, with an overall survival of 53%. That's in, in the literature if you want to see that. That's all comers, all uh, in the infratemporal fossa malignancies. So just a little bit further back from what we talked about, but still not in the temporal bone, is the uh, infratemporal fossa. We'll uh, talk about the temporal bone tomorrow. Um, but in case you, there are some easy ways to get there with just some movement of the zygomatic arch or orbital zygomatic process. Thanks.